Um, well, welcome to everyone who's tuning in right now. Uh, my name is Alina Suarez. I have been a participant in the Columbia 2021 course, uh, which was virtual for humanities. I was a fellow this past summer, and now I am fulfilling the alumni engagement and outreach um, fellow position with WSP currently. So our lovely ladies that we have here with us are Genevieve Chase. Uh, Genevieve is currently a scholar attending Yale University. She has some background with the Army Reserves and she was a participant in the Princeton STEM course in 2021 and Columbia uh, cohort in 2021 as well. We also have a uh, Trin Fan who has some background in the Army Reserves as well. And she participated in this past summer's MIT and Harvard courses. And we also have Larissa, who has some background in the National Guard. So um, we'll just go ahead and get started. So <clears throat> um, ladies, if each one of you can please answer this question for me. What branch of service are slash were you in? How long have you been in? And were you prior active duty? I might go first because that's a three part question I might forget. <laughs> so let me see if I can remember this. Um, I have been in the Army Reserve since 2003. And um, I was not, I did not do a regular Army as we would call it. I just um, did a long, a lot of tours for a long time on, on active duty, supporting active component. I don't remember the rest of the question, sorry. <laughs> No, no, no. It's it's okay. Um, a branch of service. You got that. Oh, how long have you been in? Oh, I joined in 2003. Okay. A long time. Go ahead, Tren. Uh, so I'm uh, in the U.S. Army Reserve for three years and a half, and I'm still continuing serving. Uh, I haven't been in active duty yet but uh, I plan to become an active duty in the next few years after I've done with my prep school. Okay, thank you. Uh, Larissa, go ahead. Sorry, I'm having a lot of issues today with Zoom because I'm old. Um, <laughs> I did, was in the Illinois National Guard for six years um, and then I did a year in the reserves and um, I served in Afghanistan with the Illinois National Guard and I got out also a very long time ago. So I am done and done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I myself, I'm still in the Navy reserves. Uh, I just made five years actually last week, so I enlisted in 2017, and I originally enlisted to be a reservist. Um, I do have some active duty time, though. I volunteered to deploy from May 2019 until um, about August of 2020. So uh, my next question now, what is or what was your MOS, uh, Military Occupational Specialty? So for me, I'm a 35 Lima, which is a counterintelligence special agent. Um, but because of my grade now, I believe we're intel specialists, we're generalists, because once you make E8, you are um, you no longer hold your primary MOS. You go to 35 Zulu, which is, they're changing it all the time. I think I'm a Zulu. Uh, yeah, so for me, I'm a 68 Delta. I'm an OS specialist uh, in civilian. It is a strategic attack. Larissa, go ahead. Um, I was a 74 Delta, which is chemical soldier. So basically, if you ever see like a scary movie and there's zombies and the National Guard shows up, that's my job. <laughs> Awesome. Wow. You guys all do really cool stuff. Um, I, I'm sort of, I would consider my MOS like one of the basic ones. Uh, in the Navy, I'm considered an LS, which stands for logistics specialist. And that basically means I deal with anything that has to do with supply. So that could mean um, I've worked in the post office before. I've handled um, 
uh, meals, like for the galley defect, um, I've handled MRE stuff, uh, water supply, um, everything that would go into your room um, on base, all that stuff, including uniform items and airplane parts and everything along with that. Yeah. Okay. So my next question is, uh, why did you choose to enlist in, in the reserves or the National Guard instead of active duty? I guess we'll just keep the same order, maybe. <laughs> it's just easier. Um, I joined in 2003 because uh, prior to joining the military, I was in real estate and I, um, I was very fortunate to do very well in real estate very early and, um, and have this sort of epiphany that money doesn't make people happy because I had money, but I was not happy. So I quit my job, took a year off, played Xbox and PC games. Um, and then thought about what I wanted to be when I grow up. And uh, I thought, well, working for the CIA sounds cool. So let me go join. But, but really, no, I, I mean, I grew up in the military. My grandparents are survivors, were survivors of the Japanese occupation and the Korean War. Um, and it was because of Americans that they were able to be sort of freed from, from that occupation and from the threats that they faced. So I always knew that if our country was at war, I would join. I always knew. And in 2003, we were not just in Afghanistan anymore. We were also in Iraq and I felt like it was time, it was time to go. So, and oh, sorry, why did I go reserve? Um, I, at the end of the day, I wanted to come home. I didn't want to get stationed at like Fort Polk or somewhere <laughs> or Fort Drum, which is hilariously where I went actually for my first few years with Fort Drum. Um, at the end of the day, I wanted to be able to come home. I wanted to be available when my country needed me, um, but not have you know military be my sole path if that makes sense okay so for me uh so actually i uh so my family immigrated to the u.s six years and a half um so uh when i got here uh, so my family live upon a lot of um, assistance from the community uh from school from uh uh, finance assistant, a, a lot of assistance from the uh, from the U.S. Yeah, so I feel like I have to do something to give back to the community, and uh, uh, at the same time, I want to learn more about the U.S. because you know, as an immigrant, I have a lot of uh, culture shock, and um, I need to learn the language, culture, and everything. So that okay, so military is the best environment for me, and. Uh, um, no one ever believed that uh, I can join the military because they, they think that I'm so small and it's not military, it's not for me. So I want to prove some, not prove, uh, but I want to try something to prove to myself that um, I can do it. Uh, and then I did it, uh, but I I didn't enlist to join the active duty because I want to focus on the school first and I want to get into medical school before serving uh, as an active duty, uh, and I have a, a family to take care of. I have a kid. I have a small, uh, a young kid. Uh, we don't have um, a lot of uh, helping from our parents, so that's the best way for me to support the family and focus in school and um, having time with my baby. Well, during his first uh, couple of years, is joining the reserve. Yeah, um, I, I joined when I was in college. Um, I dropped out of college and I had bounced between going back and forth and um, what I wanted to do. But the thing is, is like, I'm, I'm a very homebody and I love Illinois and I love the Chicagoland area. And I just something about serving both the president and the governor, like I totally bought into all that. And plus like, active duty isn't really me like I, if there wasn't a war going on I probably wouldn't have joined the military um so I only wanted to go be a soldier and go overseas and at that time it seemed like the best way to do that would be by going to either National Guard or Reserves um and then I did my six years took my two years of inactive ready reserves. And I always say um, I was a burnt out mommy because I had two kids at that time and I was just looking for some me time. And one week in a month, two weeks a year sounded lovely. 
um, even though we all know that that's not really how it works. And <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just thought I would try it again and it just didn't work. I did a year and it, because it didn't work out for my family, it wasn't really a good fit. And that's that. Um, well, I, I decided to enlist into the reserves, uh, because it was sort of forced upon me. Um, my senior year, I was about 17 and a half when the idea of joining the military sparked up in my mind before that. Um, I'm the youngest out of my family. So I was the one most pressured to go to a big university right out of high school. But with that also being said, um, I come from a large military family. So we have uh, like three Marines, two airmen, and my sister is also in the Navy. So um, because of my sister, she convinced my mom that I shouldn't go active duty and that I should pursue reserves and put make school my priority uh, because she's still, she's been in for about 10 years now and she hasn't completed her bachelor's yet. Um, so that was mainly why <laughs> I also couldn't sign a full active duty contract by myself at that time. And I was too stubborn to wait another six months to enlist, um, but it ended up working out for me. So, uh, you know, I definitely got to put school first um, and sort of mess up in school and volunteer to deploy. So I got um, some of that active duty itch off of my shoulders. Uh, and Larissa, you kind of touched on it um, when you said your piece. So now we're gonna go into what the time commitment looks like um, for each of you and, is that specific to the branch that you're in? Uh, and if you could just, you know, shed some light on that. I think um, having been in for 19 years, the time commitment has changed uh, with the different units I've belonged to and the different positions I've been in. Um, in the last several years, I've been in leadership actually since 2014. Uh, so it's taken up a significant amount of my time. And, and honestly, it's one of the reasons why I'm looking forward to retirement next year, because I feel like in the Army Reserve, especially, we sort of expect a great deal out of our reserve leadership. And there is no way you can do even halfway of a decent job by just doing one weekend a month. So it, you know, I'm on emails usually every day. Um, in fact, once I got accepted to Yale, my commander was nice enough to let me step aside. So there's actually someone else who's taken over my position um, because he knew that this was a priority and that I needed to do this. So I'm um, actually going to either transfer into the IAR or to an IMA unit. For those of you that don't know, um, inactive ready reserve means you're essentially still on the roster, but you're not uh, participating actively. I think you have like a muster once a year, um, but the IMA program is the Individual Mobilization Augmentee Program. And that's a very special type of um, reserve soldier that essentially uh, we call it, they go by different rules. Like you're, you manage your own career, you manage your own stuff. Um, and so it's a little more liberal with, with things. Instead of drilling one weekend a month, I would do all those drills in like a month full time on orders with my unit over the summer or something like that. So there are some, there's some flexibility within the Army Reserve um, in terms of changing positions or um, changing units and stuff like that, so. Yeah, so, um, uh, so same like uh, Genevieve, so I also drill um, two days a month and uh, almost every month someone uh, we have break like this one right? we have a break yeah and uh we also have uh, annual training sometimes it's uh two weeks sometimes three weeks depends if uh, we are on special duty so it will take three weeks away uh and um during the annual training so uh, we have the long day training because normally uh, so we are the the hospital we are the I said the few hospital it means uh, when they throw out the mission for us, they will bring us to an um, empty blank space and then they throw all the equipment and we start setting up the hospital, build up from zero to uh, from none to something. Yeah. So uh, we work long hour during the, um, the 80 and uh, it means staying away from home. And um, uh, on top of that, um, sometimes we have trainings that uh, uh, we have to 
skip school or like um, skip other family responsibilities to to fulfill the training as well. And uh, we also have to do the PT on our own time and uh, manage all the um, um, the document work uh, by our own time. Um, if well, as a as a result, we have to stay disciplined and we have to stay motivated by ourselves because because we are not in the environment. So we have to keep ourselves busy and um, but we have the the army mindset. So it it easy to to lose interest and lost lost track. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I also uh, try to keep track of emails and I assisting other soldiers in my unit when they need. And I also volunteer at some uh, uh, events at the recruiting office uh, in order to keep myself around the army world. Yeah. Yeah, so it's been a few years since I got out, but um, yeah, that one weekend a month, two weeks a year, I feel like that's a little misleading. It's maybe more like a minimum. <laughs> um, cause I, I mean, I've had months where I've had two drills or, you know, it's, it's eight weeks and we've had three drills, um, especially when you're getting ready to deploy or, uh, when I was in the reserves, there was the rumor that we may deploy. So then we had this like extra risk, you know, drill and yeah, two weeks. Yeah. Sometimes, um, sometimes three weeks I've been on AT for five weeks. So, and then the, the personal stuff on your own time. I don't know how it is now, but back in the day, like accident avoidance. Yeah. So, oh my God, I must've taken that class like a thousand times. Um, I was lucky though, that like when I did have some personal issues come up with my family, that I was able to take some time off. I was also pregnant with both pregnancies while I was in the national guard. And, um, it's not so much as like the army standard, but I was really lucky to be in uh, mostly like female company with some really great leadership where I was able to take off more than the minimum for like my maternity leave. Um, but yeah, lots of emails and messages and it was just like never ending. I just, it, that's what it felt like. And that's why it like, it ended up not working for my family because it was always like, I felt like I was like one step in and one step out, you know, I was always on the border of it. So like, if I wasn't away with the army, I was still doing stuff for army stuff to get ready for the next time. And then when I was there, I was just trying to, you know, keep track stuff at home. And so it can, it can take over way more than the part-time. Alina, I just wanted to add to that really quick. Cause I, yeah. that, um, the thing that we all forgot to mention is the additional training. So as you progress in your career, whether an officer enlisted, you have these mandatory sort of benchmarks you have to meet in these different trainings. Like um, we call it BLC, basic leader. I don't know what it's called now. I guess I should know this, <laughs> um, but ALC, the advanced leader course, the senior leader course. And they keep adding these courses that you have to do that you need in order to get promoted and to progress within your career. So that's just on the army side, that's on the soldier side. And then on top of that, you have your, your MOS, right? As an intelligence person and counterintelligence, there are all these schools that I need to go to to remain relevant in my job. Um, and so some of them can be as long as six months. Um, it's, yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot. There's a lot more, I'm sure trend with the medical, I used to have some 68 whiskeys and my medics had to get recertified all the time, which is a lot of extra training that they had to do on their own. Now I have analysts and in order for my analysts to progress in their career, they also have, you know, training that they have to do. So I think that's something I forgot to mention. So it's very interesting that all of you, you know, sort of come with like an army or national guard perspective, because to contrast everything that you all just said in the, in the Navy reserves, it's entirely different. Um, my drills are strictly only two days a month. And that's, um, we muster at 0800. Saturdays were usually done after a unit, unit PT at around 1400. And then Sundays is specifically for administrative duty. So if you're all done with everything you need to do by 1300, then you're good to go for the drill weekend. Um, so that's definitely been amazing for me with my, um, with all of my school semesters and finals and midterms. And I would say in particular with this unit that I'm drilling with now, everyone's priority is to get their degree and everyone knows this, including our officers, um, the captain of our unit. So 
for instance, over the summer, you know, I was working with WSP and um, I had to, you know, fulfill my AT requirement. And I told them, hey, you know, this is what this program does. Um, this is something that I, you know, I really want to get into like sociology, social work stuff. So they allowed me to do my AT broken up and I did 10 days in one section when I could. And then I made up the other four days. Um, and four of those days were actually telework because we were still allowed to telework um, as the fiscal year is drawing to a close. I don't think they're going to carry that on to, ne to next fiscal year, at least in the Navy. Um, so it's been very lenient. It's been uh, very doable for me in my schedule. And I know we've had, um, I think we've had two women that have gone on mater maternity leave and uh, the same thing that you sort of mentioned, Larry. So they allowed them to take the extended time if I needed to reschedule because of school, because of something, I would totally be able to as long as I had, you know, two weeks notice. Um, but I will say uh, I am an E5, so that comes with some leadership responsibility, not as much as an E5 in the Marines or Army, I would say. Um, but with that being said, I do have to check my email. Not, I wouldn't say on a daily basis. I would say probably at the end of the week. And there's maybe one thing I have to do for my unit administratively before the drill weekend, um, but I'm able to not consider it, not get paid for it, but count that towards my retirement for points. Um, and I'm able to do that because I have great leadership and they say, you're doing something for the reserves, document it, send it over to us and we'll make sure that you get the retirement points for it. Um, so I just wanted to say, say that piece. And that's interesting that I didn't realize, you know, all of the extra training and everything that you all had to do being in the National Guard and Army Reserves. Um, yeah, in, in the Navy, not so much. And for I, Genevieve, you did mention the leadership training. Um, for us, it would actually fall on a drill weekend. So if we made rank through um, the tests that we take for advancement and through, they grade all of our evaluations. And if we have a good grade on our test and a good grade on our evaluations, then um, you're supposed to get advanced. And if that happens, then you basically have to do like a, a two day leadership course um, wherever you're at. They'll do it at like your main um, Navy Reserve Center or something. So it's very convenient in that sense for us. I, you just to add to that, um, as an E8 who is supposed to be making E9, which is Sergeant Major, the highest enlisted rank, um, in order to make E9, I have to go to Fort Bliss, Texas for a year for school and attend the Sergeant Majors Academy. So um, you either have to do it online or you have to do it in person. And uh, it's it's an extensive, very long course. So a lot of times reservists are doing this remotely and having to do it online and balance that with family and with their military or school careers or whatever it is that they're pursuing at the time. But yeah, it's a lot. So that's why one of the reasons why I'm opting to retire, which is not what I planned. I mean, obviously I spent the last 18 years, 19 years, hoping I would make Sergeant Major, um, but school's kind of, this This is more important. So I had to make a decision. I had to let one, I have to let one go. Right. And actually, Genevieve, I think you, you bring up a great point and it's on to my next question is how, how do you balance the responsibilities you have in your life with your military obligation? And if you're a parent, if you could shed some light on how you deal with childcare and that sort of stuff during your drill weekend? Um, I think being a student is sort of new to me, being a full-time student. I haven't been a full-time student since, well, we won't say how long ago it was. Um, so this is unique. And it's also unique to come back to school after having a brain injury. So I essentially have to sometimes repeat things and I work with the accessibility services and I have to learn all these new um, apps and things that help me with taking notes and, and, and stuff like that, which has been amazing. And, and, and I feel empowered to do much better in school than I, than I would on my own. But um, it, in the past, you know, I was working full time for the government. I was running a nonprofit organization trying to advocate for women's issues and veterans issues. Um, and then on top of that, I was also in the army reserve. And, and really I have to say more than anything, it really depended on my command. If my camp command was really supportive of what I was doing, then um, I was able to sort of step aside. And, and, and my leadership has always been super supportive because they know I'm out there trying to fight for veterans issues. Um, so that was always really great. And then working in Intel was also really awesome because 
you can't take your work home with you because it's classified. <laughs> so you do your 40 hours a week and then you go home and that's, and that's sort of it. So um, in the past, it wasn't, it, it was a challenge, um, especially if I was in leadership because I personally felt like I was never doing enough for my soldiers um, or that I wasn't giving them enough. And so I probably beat myself up more than I think anybody else did. Uh, but now that I'm in school, um, I've had to make, you know, I have to really look at this situation and reassess and try to decide um, what's, what my priority is at this time. And, I, and I'm fortunate to be in a position where I'm about to retire. So, you know, I don't know if you guys know, but you have short, the short timer syndrome. So um, we start planning for retirement about a year to 18 months out. Um, so I feel lucky that I, I get to transition from one aspect of my life and close like, like sort of one chapter and then explore this new chapter that might be coming up or is coming up, is happening, cool. <laughs> Okay, so um, that. so for me, uh, uh, being a soldier, a, a mother, a wife, and a full-time student, I also being a, a leader in my community and at my school, I would say it needs a lot of discipline and a lot of self-motivation and a lot of support from the family as well. Yeah, so I got very lucky because my husband, he really respect me and he really support me to pursue my dream and uh, pursue my army career. So I don't have a lot of uh, challenge to do with my husband. Yeah, but um, uh, but there's a lot of sacrifice from, from me and from my family as well. So um, mental health is the, also the, the key thing because like uh, the last couple of semester, I was so burned out from all the work. So I tried to throw myself in a lot of uh, things that I tried to be on top of everything at my unit, at my school, being a leader. And I try to maximum everything. And then during the summer, after the WSB course, I come back. During the last month, I was so worn out. I couldn't do anything. And I, yeah, but I'm glad that it happened before my school start. So I can take that time to think about myself, say, okay, so what did I do? And why I burn out so bad? So I know how to balance it. And it's not a fact. Mm, a lot yeah and then as Genevieve he, he say um, we, we must know what is the most priority at the time so we know the cost of uh, doing something and losing something so we choose which one is priority at the time is the key yeah and should I talk about the, the parent stuff or something yeah yeah please if you can <laughs> okay yeah so um, I'm a parent so um, I, I, when I enlisted, um, my baby, he already in the childcare. So actually because I joined, so we have to rush to find our childcare for him. <laughs> that time he is around, uh, let's see, 20, uh, no. Yeah. 20 months. Yeah. About 20 months. So, um, we have to find a, a childcare, uh, a preschool near my house so we can bring him in. Um, uh, so right now he's five years old and he in kindergarten. So it's not bad during the day, but uh, after that, the after school and babysitting is a way of pain for us because we have to take turn to take care of him. So, uh, but this this uh, school year coming, I mean, I'll stay in the the dorm. It means uh, my husband have to take, stay home with him. So we have to take turn to stay at home with him with uh, my baby and helping him with the homework. And uh, I think it's very important because. Uh, we don't want him to feel lonely because he's the only child. <laughs> we we don't have enough family close to us, so it's it's really hard for us. Yeah, and um, I don't know. Maybe uh, I I I don't I don't feel safe enough to to leave my baby with someone else. So babysitting is really hard. Yeah. Yeah. So when I was in the National Guard, um. We went to, like, I mean, I got out of basic training and then we deployed right away. Um, and when I was there, I met my husband. And then when we came back, you kind of get like a little bit of a break. But in that time period, my husband redeployed and got injured. 
And I was really lucky that I didn't have to make that choice of balancing and that I had a really good unit. And well, he was in the British Army, so he had a really good unit too that they were able to communicate back and forth. And I was able to take a bunch of time off that um, that really helped with that. But then we soon found out we were pregnant and with childcare. And when he came to America, I worked full time. He couldn't work, so I had to work full time. I drilled and we had that baby at home um, and it really wouldn't have worked out if my husband wasn't a stay at home dad at that time. And we didn't have the family help because, you know, we were living in the Chicagoland area. Everybody I know have ever known in my life basically is from Chicago. Um, so we had a lot of support, but when we had our second child, um, he had started working and kind of had to make the decision of like, do we want two working parents and one both traveling. And so for us and for me, it was just, honestly, I, I couldn't do it. I know a lot of people do do it though. I have a lot of friends who have stayed in as mothers and fathers and they balance it and they finish degrees and they finish graduate degrees and everything. Um, and I think there was a long time in my life too, where I was like really disappointed, like, why can't I just do everything? And my family situation was just probably different from other people's and I had to just make that choice eventually. And it just happened sooner rather than later that, you know, I had to put my family first, which is, you know, and like the military mission comes first. So childcare, I think it's awesome. I've know seen some things about childcare now with like reserves being covered or like options that things weren't around back when I was in. Um, so we definitely relied a lot on family and I'm, I'm really, really blessed that I have such great family that were able to help me. Um, yeah, I don't know how to do school in <laughs> the, the, the reserves. So yay for all you are able to balance it. <laughs> You know what, Larissa, thank you for just being transparent and so honest, all of you, um, because it is it is hard. It is a struggle. And I I don't have any kids. I don't have any fur babies. Um, I used to have plants and they died. So, <laughs> um, you know, I don't have any of those responsibilities. And I have the amazing privilege of having a partner that is just extremely supportive of me going to school full time. Um, and actually one of the reasons I deployed uh, back in 2019 was to receive some of my GI Bill because you know, as you all know, being a reservist or National Guard status, you don't get the GI Bill unless you have some active duty time under your belt. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm extremely grateful that my partner is very supportive. And uh, before I got hired with WSP, I was sort of like casually working at Starbucks, um, but, that got old very quick because I would do the opening shift. So I, I would have to be at work at um, 4.30 every morning and I'd work until about nine or 10. And I'd usually go to the gym for maybe an hour, sometimes less, at least 30 minutes. And then immediately after I would come home, shower and eat lunch while I was doing one of my lectures. And then as soon as I got home until, sort of until I went to bed, it was like school, school, school. Um, so now I'm in my senior year and I don't have as many classes. I'm still considered a full-time student, but um, thankfully I chose to leave all of my electives until my last year. And I'm so glad I did that. Uh, so I don't have a lot of readings for my classes, but I will say, you know, it is, it does get tricky sometimes having to juggle like school and, um, you know, work now. So um, I also want to credit Genevieve. You mentioned apps and stuff. I would be nowhere without um, actually my iPad here with my questions on it. My iPad, um, my Notability app, my Todoist apps, all of my apps that really help keep me on track. Um, something that's really worked for me and my partner too has been I will share my Google Calendar with him. And so he knows when I have things for work, um, I'll share my school email calendar with him so he knows if I have midterms or something that's really important that we don't schedule any dates any vacations around that time um so I think especially with my partner it's just really been all about communication between us and you know I have my calendars and he has his calendars and it's really um we just make sure that at the end of the day an hour before we go to sleep is like wind down time like no screen time Lately, we've been really big into Legos, so we'll spend an hour building Legos, which has actually been really fun. 
Um, but it's important for us to just be able to release all the stresses of the day and make sure that like, you know, we don't um, release it onto each other. And my partner, he's active duty Navy, Navy. So, um, and he's actually going through season right now. He got picked up for E7. So he's very stressed <laughs> for the next couple of weeks, but you know, we, we've already had these sort of systems in place and it's really just us making sure that we hold each other accountable. And we also make sure that we're disciplining ourselves to stick to it. And, you know, once you fall out of it, or once you have a bad week or something, you really just got to hop back on it. So, um, yeah. And kudos to Trin and Larissa for having kiddos, man. I don't know how y'all do it, but wow. Super women. Um, okay. So speaking of being super women, can any of you shed light on some struggles you faced as being a woman in the reserves or National Guard? That's a really big question. <laughs> um, I, I think right now that's kind of calmed down for me. Um, as opposed to, you know, 20 years ago when I joined and it wasn't so common to have women uh, attached to combat units or, or working with combat units or going outside the wire. I mean, when I, when I was deployed on my first deployment, women weren't technically allowed in combat. Um, so the, one of the biggest challenges I faced was coming home from that deployment and then transitioning back to civilian life without a support network or really anyone else around me who had been through that deployment with me. Cause when you come home as active duty, you know, you're, you come back to your unit. And even if you PCS somewhere else, everybody sort of understands, right. Everybody's sort of transitioning back into, um, you know, military life or garrison, as we say. Um, but as a reservist, you come back to your, what we call Fort living room. And, um, and so you don't necessarily have that support and, uh, and people who, who at least understand what you've been through really. And so when I first came back, the resources that were available to us were nil. I mean, my transition was a paper list with a list of websites to go to. If I needed, if you want education, go to this website. If you want this, go to this website. And, um, and I just initialed it. That was my out processing. And so um, I worked really hard to change that. It was one of the main drivers of me getting involved in veterans advocacy. Um, I got involved with fighting for the post 9-11 GI Bill because um, in my mind, I knew that we were going to need a place to land and that we were going to need um, to be able to open up our opportunities in, in our minds and, and the possibilities that come with having a, a degree and having an education. Um, and, you know, I used to always say, like, we, we need we need soldiers and sailors and airmen, Marines downrange dreaming bigger dreams. And I believed truly that the, that the post 9-11 GI bill would, um, would pave the way for that, that that was the, oh, that was the door. That was the opportunity, um, that we all could go through. So, um, it's changed so much. And I feel like my answer to that question, you know, 10 years ago, even is quite a bit different than what that response is now as a woman in the army reserve now, um, I think probably the hardest thing for me is really not hard. It's just a personal thing. It's getting to watch all these young women come in and go out and try out for Rangers or try out for special forces. These dreams that I wanted for myself that, um, that I could never do. It's really incredible to watch them get to do these things and have these opportunities. So I'd have to say like, personally, that's really kind of both the most inspiring and also it's like a bittersweet kind of feeling. Um, but also I think, and this isn't just particular to uh, being a woman in the reserves, but just coming towards the end of my military career, I'm starting to get that fear or that, like, I don't know, anxiety of like, what is it going to be like not being in the military? I mean, I was born on an army base. I grew up on military bases and, um, not being able to step up when, you know, if we, if, if I retire and then, you know, some war breaks out. Um, I'm not going to be able to just like grab my crap and go, you know? And so that's, that's, those are things I think about now. They're more existential, I think, than actual like challenges that I'm really facing um, as, as a woman in the army reserves. I think we've come so incredibly far 
in just the last 10 to 15 years that it's, it's really mind blowing to me. And, um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm super excited for all the other women, hopefully, hopefully, you know, I always resented sometimes the women who came before me because I felt like, you know, they should have fought for these things for us. Um, like, you know, the repeal of don't ask, don't tell and, and, and other, other, other things that maybe didn't necessarily impact me personally, but definitely impacted my brothers and sisters to my left and right. Um, and I, and I really hope that women who are coming in now don't feel that way about my generation. Like, I really hope they look at my generation of, of women who served and say, you know what, they, they went out there and proved we could do it. And then they made the military make it allowable, like make it, make it a thing. So I don't know, sorry, I get emotional when I think about that. So. Thank you for that. Yeah, so uh, to me, uh, other struggles. So uh, I think, uh, again, there's still the family responsibility, especially if you have a kid. So it may affect your duties or promotion or learning opportunities because there are a lot of trainings um, that uh, need us to go out, not stay in our state, but um, can happen at other base that uh, we need to travel. Yeah, and then um, so if we have family stuff to take care of so it's sometimes it may affect your opportunities to gain the point for promotion and um, that is a real thing that is a real struggle that um, I have discussed with a lot of soldiers in my unit and um, we all agree on that another thing is um, uh, the pressure to perform the same like the men so um, I don't want to say men they don't have responsibilities but um, as a female we may we may have more responsible responsibilities than them like um just our instinct to take care of the family and get something like that yeah so um uh but uh, uh in 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 the military we are the same right so main uh, male female we are the same we we are expected to perform uh the same yeah, so um yeah so uh, um that is kind of a pressure to uh, to perform well in the in the military to show your best and uh, another thing I think uh, we may struggle is uh, maybe the physical fitness so we so compared to the males so we sometimes we too small we too short compared to them right so um, I don't want to say the, the physical performance so uh, we may we can perform very well yeah but uh, so for some duties um, it may affect us like a lot of uh, tasks or duty that need uh, people who have a lot uh, more taller than us. Yeah, so it may affect a little bit, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so when I was deployed, I was also deployed when women weren't allowed in combat with an infantry brigade. So riddle me that, uh, <laughs> you know, sitting in combat underneath an infantry flag, but we're not supposed to be there. Um, so, but I, like I said, like 74 Delta just seems to be like a catch-all for females at the time. So I mostly was with other females. So in that unit, I really didn't feel like I, it probably didn't feel like how other people's experiences were. And even like my male um, battle buddies were great. Like my my male sergeant's the one who would help me find when I was breastfeeding places to like pump. Like, I mean, he found me like sitting in the VFW, like coat closet pumping for like my baby on a drill weekend. Um, so I, I lucky in that aspect, but at the same time, you know, being pregnant, breastfeeding, um, being married to somebody who also is in the military who ended up getting hurt. That was a whole other thing and stuff that had taken time away from my, you know, concentrating on, because when we had started drilling again was when he was injured. So I missed a lot of um, just things with the unit, things, you know, getting back in the, the feel of it. And then I was pregnant and there's not too much you can do when you're pregnant. So um, I would say that, um, but coming home, and not being with my people. I think when I finally did get out of the National Guard, it really felt alienating because that had been my family, that had been my support network. Those were all my mom friends. You know, there was a big baby boom when I got back and then there was like a second round of baby boom and I was pregnant again. So I got to be part of that again. 
And it was like the funnest time ever was being pregnant with like all your best friends, you know? And we had like this pair of like pregnancy pants that like we kept like passing around to like the next girl who got pregnant so she could wear it. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think one of the, the things is probably like just military sexual trauma, like that whole thing. Like, I mean, I heard some really nasty things from other soldiers, like, and I don't know why they thought it was okay to say it to me. Um, just over the years, I don't know if that's still a thing, but that was a problem back then. I have to say, I, I never really felt like the women before us didn't, didn't fight because I feel like women before us, like if you look at our country's history, no woman was ever told, no woman was ever told that she had to, to fight for her country. I mean, we all volunteered from the start, you know, from Deborah Sampson on. And we were, you know, we weren't given these opportunities like a lot of other, you know, minorities at the time, you know, through our country's history, just weren't given the opportunities. And we had, I mean, it was a long fight, but I'm, I'm so excited to see like when, you know, the first female Rangers and the, I just saw a commercial about paternity leave for the, the army reserves. Oh my God, that's awesome. So I'm like so excited for the next generation. Um, but I, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard, but I think it's hard for anybody definitely being female is really hard. I mean, like anyone else ever get their period in the field? I mean, <laughs> like that sucks, but, um, you know, you just kind of adapt and overcome at the same time. So, yeah. <laughs> you all hit on some amazing points, man. That's, a, that's hard to follow up on. Um, Lil said sisterhood of traveling pants vibes, Larissa with the maternity leave pants. Um, I like that. That's awesome. Uh, but speaking of sisterhood, so as a I had mentioned before, um, I have an older sister who's in the Navy. She's about 10 years older than me. So um, when I was graduating high school, getting ready to join, she had already been in for 10 years. She was already an E5. Um, I'm slowly but sure in catching up to her in rank, but that's another story. Um, so I had, you know, the amazing opportunity to, for her to just be transparent and straightforward with me with, this is what you should expect. We look very similar in terms of shape and size. And um, so when I was getting ready to deploy, you know, she was like, okay, you're going to Bahrain. She had been to Bahrain. It's a middle, it's a country in the Middle East, um, neighboring Saudi Arabia. It's a little more liberal than Saudi Arabia is, but it's still, um, you know, very conservative in the sense that there's specific way you have to dress. There's specific just um, cultural norms that you have to get accustomed to. So. Before um, I deployed, you know, she was like, make sure whenever you're in the country, you never go anywhere by yourself. You're in group of three, at least a group of three, you know, you, you can say at these hotels, don't go down this street by yourself. Don't, you know, in the country there's curfews and stuff. So um, I was very grateful that she was able to sort of lead me in that sense. Um, but being deployed, um, was a little hard for me at first. I'm not going to lie. I showed up. I was clearly the youngest person there. Um, in terms of both men and women, I was also, I think at the time I was in E3 and I had um, halfway through, I advanced to E4, which is a third class petty officer in the Navy. Um, so that all came with sort of its own challenges. And in my office, it was only men, solely men, until I hit my, until I was there for a year. And then my last couple months, um, I had a woman who she made senior chief out there. So she made E8 and she was amazing. Um, actually, she was like, she's still one of my mentees now, but it was, it was extremely hard for me to adjust um, to, I mean, just living in an environment with men surrounding me the whole time. Um, and I was grateful in the sense that my chief, my the E7 of my department, um, he had a daughter that was exactly my age, like we were two days apart, and she was in the air guard, and she was also on orders the same time I was. So, um, and I say I'm grateful to that because I think in a sense, he showed me the leadership style he would probably want someone to show his daughter. Um, so that came with, you know, him being very protective of me in a positive way. Um, he was always pushing me to be the best, do the best I can. And if there was anybody that 
was hassling me or sexually harassing me in any sense, you know, I made sure I, I let him know and I didn't have a problem with that person. Probably never saw them again, my whole deployment, um, which I think is extremely grateful just looking back at it. And Genevieve, I feel you in the sense that, you know, this topic is very emotional. Um, but uh, I also wanted Genevieve to touch on what, what you mentioned about being part of the generation before. And I consider myself part of the post generation. Um, so I, I mean, I want to say thank you, you know, for being able to pave the way for me and so many other women, um, you know, and all of the women that are going to be coming in after us, um, because I think it, if it wouldn't have been for you and so many other people advocating for us and for our rights um, in terms of education, just in terms of equality and equity across across the board. Um, I don't think that legislation such as the I, hashtag I am Vanessa Guillen bill would have gotten passed um, and so many other bills like that. I mean, I mean, that's that's just a tremendous mark in history. And, it, you know, it, I know it'll go down in the history books um, just with everything that Vanessa Guillen went through. Um, and that hit home for me the most because we're about the same age. And, um, you know, she's a Latina as well. So um, everything about her case and the bill, it just has really resonated with me. Um, and I think, you know, that now is a great time to be a woman uh, in the military because you're going to be able to have these platforms to speak on. And I think people are going to actually um, sit down and listen whenever there's something big that occurs. And I think now a lot of men also value that we have a different perspective and our perspective needs to be recognized in order for us to advance forward, like as a civilization, as a military force. So um, I wanted to add to, to what you said, um, Trin, you kind of, you know, both of you, Larissa, with your being parents, um, that is a, a significant difference. Uh, in order for, for us to become parents, we you know, it's nine months at a minimum, right? That our bodies are going through this process. And then, you know, there's recovery time after that. And, um, and then of course, if you, if you want children, you have to make that choice. And I, I think that was interesting that I, like, I never chose that. And I put off having children and to the point where it was, um, it's been too late to have children. So, um, and I, at my age, I have a lot of friends who are having similar issues. And I was part of a fertility um, thing at Walter Reed. And there are a significant number of military women who um, are now trying to have children and can't because we wanted to wait until it was a good time for our careers. And it's like never a good time for your military career, especially um, in the last couple of decades when we were, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan and Bahrain and Kuwait and like all these other places. So um, I wouldn't, I would say, I, I don't want to take away from the experience of my male, my brothers, because, you know, I don't want to say that having children to them is less important. I just think it's a little more invasive for us. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, this baby takes over your body. And then um, the changes that have been made lately by, by women who, who, like you were saying, Alina, the, um, the Vanessa Gillen case and, and even the, the Army Mom Life Facebook page where these young women got together and said, you know what, enough is enough. We want to change the way, um, if, it, if it hadn't been for them, this new generation of, of, of women advocates, um, when I had my miscarriage last year, I would have been expected to go take a PT test at my next drill. And so because of them and because of these women who are now standing, standing up and, and, and making themselves heard, um, I was able to take six months to let my body recover from my miscarriage. So no questions asked. I didn't have to prove it was traumatic. I didn't have to prove that, you know, my body wasn't ready to come back. Like it just, no questions asked. This is the new role. So things are changing. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you said this is a good time for women to be in the military. Absolutely. hundred percent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Genevieve, um, for sharing all of that. Um, I, we do have one question from Gina. Gina says, does having older family members in the military make it make it more or less anxiety making for your non-military members? An example, your civilian partners, parents, et cetera. Um, I would like to 
answer part of this. So I think having more members in the military in your family, at, at least from my family's perspective, um, it makes it easier for like your partners coming in. And I think it's easier for them to understand when my like I visit home very often because I have the ability to fly home every couple months. Whereas um, my boyfriend, he, he can't necessarily do that. And so my family, you know, they don't hold a grudge against him or anything if he doesn't show up to holiday with us or anything. Um, and I, I appreciate that because um, I know as at least in the Latina, Latino community, there's a lot of like judgment around um, if your partner doesn't go to family events or parties or anything like that. So I think it's, it's a blessing to be able to have a family that's so supportive. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to answer that question as well. Yeah, I think I can answer that. So uh, me and my brother, both of us uh, in, in the military, my brother, he's an active duty. He's um, an uh, six, eight uh, whiskey, a medic. Yeah, so um, it's always uh, being like a worry for my parents that uh, they don't want to lose kids at the same time yeah so uh i'm the one who stay at home so i will uh, always have to like take care of my parents and tell them that hey it's 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 okay we will manage and then we'll try to make you proud and we will make sure that we will be in the in the best safety as we can yeah so um it always being a struggle for my parents to accept that uh both of us uh join the, the military yeah, and uh, for my um, for my uh, extend, uh, extended family, so my in-law, they kind of uh, accept it right now, but uh, sometimes for a lot of uh, family events or gathering, I cannot, I cannot join them, I, and uh, I cannot make a frequent visit as I uh, as I am expected to to do so. Yeah, so I think I make them. Um, like kind of disappointed a little bit yeah but um uh, we all have our own life and uh, we have to set the boundary so we do the best for ourselves and the best for our closest family yeah we cannot uh, uh satisfy everyone make everyone happy for the same time yeah Thank you, Trin. Um, for the sake of time, this will be our last question. This is from Doriana um, and it's directed to Genevieve. So Genevieve, you mentioned how you had to choose between um, attending Yale and becoming an E9. As a reservist, how often do you feel like you have to choose between your civilian and military ambitions? And are there any regrets? I would say over the last 19 years, um, there are no regrets. I think even in something as significant as, for example, having a family, um, I think if I had thought about it, maybe the only regret really, and I, <laughs> I should have frozen my eggs. Like, <laughs> I know that sounds, but that's like when people ask me, like, what's your one piece of advice that you would give women joining the military? To, my military sister today? tells me that freeze all your, the time. <laughs> yeah. Freeze your eggs. Freeze your eggs. If you're a guy, freeze your sperm. You know what? <laughs> we'll just put it out there because what we're exposed to and, and the things that may happen to us is um, it's just, it's just insurance. Right. Um, but for me, I have to say, I know in my heart of hearts that if I wanted to stay in the army and um, pursue becoming an E9, I have no doubt that Yale would support me. This school has been incredible. This un I can't even describe, it's almost, it doesn't even feel real. And I know if I went to, you know, my head of college and my Dean and, you know, Dean Sodi and said, um, hey, I have to take a break for a year because of this military school that I have to go to. I know that they would be really supportive of that. Um, I just choose not to. And um, I think a huge part of that is just that I joined the army when our country was at war. And I knew I would stay in until that was done. And it is, I mean, it didn't end the way I had hoped. Don't even get me started on that. Um, but uh, I feel like you know, I was wounded. I was rocketed on a daily basis. We, we, we just, I feel like I, I did, I did my time. I, I, I feel good about my contribution. Um, so I don't know if I'll have any regrets. Um, 
maybe there'll be that little pride point where like deep inside of me, it was like, well, you were almost a sergeant major. That was your goal. But I feel as if um, in a lot of respects, I'm not done serving necessarily just because I hang up my uniform. I think that I can continue to be very involved in the veteran community through or your scholar or through my school in, in helping um, more veterans come here. Or there's so, it's like I tell people <laughs> being a female in the military and dating civilian men, <laughs> that's a whole nother topic. Um, you know, but they always like feel like they have to compensate and tell me like, oh, I would have joined the military if this. And, and, and my, my, my response to them is always, there are many, many ways to serve your country. And, um, and they can be so many, so multifaceted. So I don't know that even as I get out that my, my um, service is over. Um, and as I said, I think the one, I don't, I don't wanna say regret, but I think the one thing I would advise or caution other young women who are in the army reserves right now um, is to essentially be, well, other than freeze your eggs, is essentially be really forthcoming with what your, what your goals are with your commander, with your leadership. If you communicate with them openly and tell them like, Hey, I am going to school this. You know, I really need to take a knee. I need to just take a break. I need to step aside from this leadership position. Can you help me? They should absolutely have your back and support you in that. And I've been able to do that over the years when I was running my nonprofit organization and I was living in DC, my reserve unit was in Phoenix. And my chain of command was amazing. They would fly me out and I would go to drill, you know, like a week at a time instead of just two days, you know, and I would knock out three, three months of drill in, in one week. Um, they were able to be flexible and, and to, to do some of that. So for me, um, I've always had to balance being in the military with my civilian job and with a nonprofit. And I think, um, I don't know if that really answers the question, but uh, if you, I will put this out there. Um, if anyone, if you wanna have a more one-on-one -on -one conversation about this, I am always, always open and available to do that, um, to, to sort of hone in on that experience. I, I advise a ton of young soldiers constantly when they're making the decision and they're sitting on the fence and thinking about getting in or getting out, especially coming off active duty. Do I go in the reserves? Do I go in the IRR? Like, what do I do? Um, I've seen it all, I've heard it all. Uh, after 20 years, and I'm happy to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations if I didn't quite answer that question. Thank you so much, Genevieve. Um, and it was actually one of our WSP alumni who answered that question. So Doriana, if you're watching this and you're listening and you want me to pass you off to Genevieve, I'm more than willing to do so. Um, but for the sake of time, I did want to say thank you, Genevieve. Thank you, Trin. Thank you, Larissa. Um, and Genevieve, in your answer, you also sort of touched on um, there's so many different ways to serve your country, and I definitely believe and agree with that 100%. I think that one of the best ways you can actually go out and serve your country is by pursuing your degree, becoming educated, being able to um, stand in and fill in those positions where you're able to advocate for us in just all, all over, all across the board in STEM and humanities, um, you know, at an undergraduate and graduate level. And also with that being said, um, Shameless plug for the Warrior Scholar Project, of course. Uh, we are going to be having uh, virtual programs this December for humanities and STEM and for enlisted veterans only. And anybody who wants to obtain a bachelor's degree um, or is interested in honing in on their academic skills for either humanities or STEM, those dates are December 11th to December 16th. And if you head to our website on the Warrior Scholar Project page, you're able to um, fill out interest forms and make sure that we get you into contact with someone from our, our outreach program. So um, yes, thank you. We put the link in the chat. Well, once again, I wanted to say thank you, everyone. Thank you for spending the time. And of course, if you'd like to get into contact with any of the women you heard from, um, you can always reach us at the Warrior Scholar Project uh, Facebook page through our LinkedIn, or you can reach me on LinkedIn or on Facebook, and we'll make sure that we get you in contact. Thank you.